I'm Sophia Lemons, uh, and I teach in the computer science department here at UNH. Um, my background is in both computer science, specifically AI, and then also in education, uh, secondary ed math, and higher ed computer science. Um, so you will find that I've got a little bit of a broad view in terms of the, um, the impact of computer science, and in particular AI, on real people, because um, I've, I've sort of dived, dove, 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 dived into both fields uh, various, to various degrees. I want to emphasize, though, that uh, as is always the case for anybody, I'm one individual, and I'm going to present you with sort of the experiences and background that I have, and try to point you at folks who have experiences that I really can't speak to at the same depth or same level, um, and would encourage you to seek out, uh, similarly, other folks who have different sets of experiences than I do, than you do, and point me back to them where, where you can and where you found out about these things. So I want to answer about four questions for you, and by that I mean, you know, 20 sub-questions for each of them, but four major questions. Um, and those are what social justice is in the first place, and there, you've probably heard a thousand different definitions or different presentations of what it is or can be, uh, and uh, so I'll help to focus this in on one that, that I can present about and talk to you a little bit about. Um, why social justice in computer science is important or should be done or is relevant at all, which is much more debated than I often would wish it would be. <laughs> um, and then, what does social justice in computer science look like when it's done? Uh, at least a few examples of those and to point you in some directions. And then, uh, a little more directly and individually, how can you work towards social justice in computer science and where possible, I'll try to kind of stretch out and point out where it could apply to other disciplines, but um, I, I want to use this one specific example of my discipline to push back on some notions that are kind of broad across a lot of science. So when I talk about social justice, um, I'd like to think that we are talking about promoting equity, um, empowering people who have been historically excluded uh, from our fields, from neighborhoods, from positions of, of, you know, of power, um, and dismantling and replacing systems of privilege and oppression, which I'm sure are very loaded terms for, uh, for many people out there. Um, so to back up, when I talk about equity, I'm not necessarily talking about numerical equality, giving the exact same amount of resource or thing to someone as someone else. I gather you're going to hear a little bit about things like that uh, here in the near future, talking about assistive technology. That's one way in which we can achieve equity, where everyone has access and opportunity to follow through with that access, not just handing everybody the same sheet of paper and expecting them all to be able to take the same things from it. Um, and then empowering people who have been historically ex excluded. Um, and I, I choose my language a little specifically on that because of the fact that there's not just the limit of who is not present right now, but what barriers have been in place for how long uh, to keep people out of our fields, out of our workplaces, out of our neighborhoods, or things like that. And so there are some obvious examples that people jump to of, you know, well, legal segregation is not a thing anymore, and so this is, this is not uh, impacting people. But it does, right? Historically, the impact of those things sets the culture, the tone, and the, the sort of availability of things to people. And then dismantling systems of privilege and oppression. So when I talk about privilege or oppression, I'm talking about when advantages are offered to one group or, or, or even forced upon sometimes members of one group uh, over other people. So because the privilege, the advantage is given to one group of people, that is at the cost of excluding other groups of people. And I want to put one word of caution in when talking about these kinds of systems that often um, new systems to replace them can be proposed that don't necessarily dismantle that system of privilege or oppression. We can, as, uh, as uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said, integrate people into a burning house, uh, put them into that broken system where there are still people being harmed, there is still uh, oppression present for it. We want to move beyond that. 
being an education uh, geek in some ways, uh, I have a quote for you from one of my favorite uh, writers on pedagogy, uh, which is Paulo Freire. He said, washing one's hand of the conflict between the powerful and the powerless means to side with the powerful, not to be neutral. And I find that outside of scientific disciplines, even the individuals who would argue against this within science would typically acknowledge that this is true in the world at large. If you see a bully picking on someone and you stand by and do nothing, you're reinforcing that that behavior is acceptable in that setting, in that culture. Uh, and and we, we've seen this historically time and time again, the, the famous quote of the I didn't speak up and therefore there was no one left to speak for me when they came for me. We all know that stand, not standing up and doing something is a choice. And yet in the sciences, and I find particularly in my experiences in computer science, uh, people often think that there's some exemption in these fields, that somehow, because it is a scientific discipline, there is some neutral mode that we can act in that does not further prop up systems of oppression, does not continue the kinds of harms that are already being done in society with other tools. If science is just a tool, it can be just another tool that is used in those, those harmful ways or can be used in ways that empower and uplift people. I want to give one example that will sort of motivate several points that I would make about why social justice is important in computer science, and hopefully this video that I linked will just work. Let's see if we can get it going. It's very short, I promise. Okay. This is from a computer scientist named Latanya Sweeney, and she does work on data Data, data gathering, um, privacy, and uh, the way that big data systems, algorithmic systems, impact people. Okay. One day, I'm sitting in my office, and a, a, a reporter was there, and he types in my name into Google, because we were looking for an old paper of mine, and up pops this ad that implied I had an arrest record. Meanwhile, I show him what the result is we were looking for. He says, no, no, tell me about this arrest. And I said, <laughs> and I said well, I've never been arrested. And he says, then why does, it, why does it say this? And we go on and on, and we began searching more and more names, and we started noticing this pattern. And he jumps to the conclusion, ah, it's because you have one of those black names, he says. And I said, oh, that's ridiculous. It's a computer. Computers can't be partial. So, uh, and uh, I would spend hours and hours trying to show him that he was wrong. And eventually I do this cross country, 120,000 ad uh, research project um, uh, when I actually learned that it was absolutely true that these ads showed up uh, implying an arrest. It had nothing to do with whether or not the company or there was an arrest record under that person's name, but if you had a name that was primarily assigned to black babies, you were more likely to get an ad in indicating arrest than if you had a name more assigned to white babies. So that's one example of a way in which computing systems that are presented as being a neutral tool that just take the data and feed back to us information from, from that data and decisions and, and helpful uh, choices um, can actually be biased in ways that sound sort of ludicrous on the surface. Of course a computer can't, on its own, be racist and, uh, and, and make decisions based on those kinds of bias. Um, so I want to dig a little deeper into what kinds of things can cause computer science to be a part of the systems that oppress people, that promote discrimination, or things like that. Um, and then toward the end, I'll talk a little bit about more of how we can uh, work contrary to those, work against those. So I'm breaking the motivation for social justice in computer science into three sub-questions, sub-categories, as I mentioned. What we do with CS, is one of the reasons that CS needs social justice. What bias is included in computer science applications uh, is another reason that we need so social justice in computer science. And who is allowed and encouraged to do computer science is another, is my final reason that I will give for why we need social justice in computer science. When I talk about what we do with CS, I'm talking about applications. 
So here are a few examples of applications of CS that uh, have at least arguable ethical implications and real implications on human beings. Um, so the, the company Palantir, founded by one of the founders of PayPal, um, had stepped up to help track undocumented immigrants and even possibly uh, you know, create a database of Muslim immigrants in the US. Um, Google had a contract with the Pentagon called Project Maven in which they helped uh, write AI for drones uh, to, to do missile targeting. Um, and then Apple and Google were accused of uh, participating in gender apartheid by hosting applications from the Saudi government that allow men to track the movements of women and to either give them permission or stop them from leaving certain areas or leaving the country. Um, and then Facebook, their ad system allowed options for people to post job ads and select groups that they did or did not want to see those job ads based on categories that are illegal to discriminate against in terms of gender, age, and race. So there's two sort of groups to these kinds of applications in the way that I think about it. And that is, on the one hand, the first two, creating databases to, to track uh, immigrants or, or Muslims and um, creating technology for targeting drones is something that there's a financial incentive to create, actively create an application like uh, Google or Palantir are, were doing in those cases that further violence and oppression, right? So these are the ones that I think typically you can at least get someone to engage in a discussion about because someone is actively chosen, I am going to write that code that does that thing. And if that thing is wrong, probably writing the code that does that thing is wrong. And these, these are usually easy to approach from sort of an outer stand, outer, outsider standpoint from the social justice angle, that should we do this with CS? That's a question that people are often willing to, to, to kind of engage with, um, whether they agree or disagree on the particular details of that situation. One of the harder questions that we often end up having to ask in the case of computer science is the accountability for providers who enable or host services and content that encourage harm to others, actually do harm to others, or promote discrimination. My second two examples are ones that I would put more in this category. Well, Apple and Google will often say, we didn't write the application to track the movements of women. We didn't write the application to stop them from being able to leave the country. The, someone wrote it, and they put it up on the Apple Store, and they put it up on the Android uh, Google Play Store, and that's, we're just hosting that there. Um, and similarly, there have, uh, oh, sorry, no. So they, they make these arguments that they're not responsible for what's created through their, their systems. Similarly, Facebook says, we didn't discriminate in any ads. There's a checkbox, and someone checked that box. But likewise, someone had to create the box and leave it open in a job ad posting to be able to discriminate in that way using that system. Um, so there's often this distancing from accountability um, to say we're just hosting, we've just created the platform, we're not necessarily responsible for that. On the other hand, I myself have had an application banned from the Google Play Store, so clearly they think that there are some applications, mine enabled people to share the, the uh, data plan from their phone with other devices, which was allowed by some carriers and not others. Um, and <laughs> And they, they banned this from the Google Play Store, so they, ha they do obviously believe that they do have some responsibility and that they do have some right to make decisions around what's appropriate in their platforms. Um, they simply often don't want to be held accountable for the ones that they find controversial or perhaps profitable. There's again that profit motive included in these things. So these two categories are one of the things that, that bring us into questions and discussions of what we do with CS and how a social justice mindset in CS could help us to more appropriately address some of these, these decisions and, and create computer science for the broader good. I also mentioned bias, and I think you can imagine this sort of thing is included in the example that Dr. Sweeney presented in the video. Um, so computer science applications 
do not, as I said before, from scratch have bias necessarily included in them. But I'll look at how those systems have bias built into them or introduced in them because humans are involved in these things. So I want to give one relatively innocuous example, still certainly has impact on people. So what you see here is the, I think this is laser, you see English being translated into Turkish. In the Turkish, there are not uh, demarcations of gender in that language. So when it comes from English to the Turkish, the same phrasing is used for he or she in those settings. So I only show you this because probably the majority of you don't, would not know what the Turkish says here or what the original English intention might have been. But if we use Google Translate to take a statement like he is a nurse and she is a doctor and translate it into Turkish, it loses the gendered markings in it. When we translate it from Turkish to English, they're meaning that it originally, in this case, does not have the gendered markings, and then bring it into English, the algorithm translates it according to what is the most natural, and by its definition, the most correct uh, translation of that text into English. And so to the algorithm, the most correct translation is that she would be a nurse and he would be a doctor. And it learns this, right? It learns this from examples and from the, the people who wrote the algorithm or what they have fed into it for it to learn from. So I want to break that down a little more to talk about these kinds of algorithms because throughout our day-to-day -day life, there are tons of these algorithms making decisions for us, suggesting things to us, um, making decisions about us like credit card applications or credit card fraud detection or things like this as well. So this is one small example. Um, I want to take a, another example to think about a hypothetical system for helping you make hiring decisions. I say it's hypothetical because I'm not picking apart a particular one because most of them are proprietary and I wouldn't be able to access the code and know what the actual algorithm is in the first place, which is part of what I'll talk about here. But um, there are plenty of them. There are plenty of systems that do this basic thing. You get tons of applications to your organization, and some of them are spam, some of them are fraudulent, some of them are um, incomplete, and some of them are people who might look like they could be a good fit on paper, but might not actually work out in your organization. And so it's certainly in your best interest to want to have some system that helps you to filter, right? And that's what the algorithm would do. Our theoretical algorithm here would help you to filter, either to filter which applications make it to your desk, or even beyond that, to filter who you invite for an interview, because that requires time and resources. Um, and so our goal in building that algorithm would be to maximize the resources that we put into it and make it most likely the people that we invite for our interviews or the people whose uh, applications we review are people who have a good chance of being successful at our company. Let's say either people we would have hired by past indications or people who we would have retained for a longer period of time, you know, say five years out, we've got our own records of that or something. So, the tricks to this are that decision-making algorithms like this have to be given a model or build a model. Many of you are familiar with the idea of building a statistical model, but to give the general concept here, um, we've got our algorithm would look at, say, their resume, their references, et cetera, and often these algorithms are left to decide what features to include in the first place, sometimes we would delineate them like the, the rows in a spreadsheet to say, here are the 10 things that we're going to make decisions on, um, and then it would decide which ones are how, how important each one is. Often, though, these algorithms are left to completely on their own build the model themselves to look at all of the possible data and try to find any correlation that they can between that data and success and, and the proper decision that they're supposed to be helping to make. So they have to have some model, which means they're deciding on features to pay attention to and features to ignore from, say, those resumes that we're examining. Then those decision-making algorithms have to be trained using existing data. So we feed into them, say, for our organization, the past history of all of the applications we've gotten, all of the people we invited for interviews, and the 
uh, the records, the employment records of the people that we hired from those previous searches. Or it may be trained on a broader model. If this company is a bigger company selling us this algorithm, they may have trained on tons of Fortune 500 companies' records of hiring and applications and things like that. So it can be localized or broader, but the point is it has to get some data from somewhere to predict the likelihood of the kinds of outcomes that it's wanting to, uh, to, to identify and to see for each of those features in the model. Did, for instance, having more than three years of employment at this other institution correlate with people who, who were successfully employed at our company? Great, then we can rate that very highly. Those decision-making algorithms then, as I've sort of hinted at already, optimize to best fit their predictions to the training data and the model that they've built. So they want to match the predictions to say, if they said someone was a good candidate, that's gonna be based on who looked like a good candidate in the past, based on your previous data that you fed to it. Um, so these are all relatively standard, and there's nothing insidious or terrible about any of this necessarily. How the problems with bias get introduced into these kinds of systems are, uh, there's a lot of uh, pieces of how they get introduced, but I'll pull apart a few of them. So one of the issues that comes about is that a lot of these are presented as black boxes. They're presented as, you don't get to see, for example, uh, why the Google resu results came up for you that came up. Um, you don't always necessarily get to see why that resume that's handed to you is the one that was handed to you. Um, and this is actually important to the business model of most of the companies that are making these algorithms. Um, for example, Facebook has argued because the European, European Union's privacy laws dictate that a user should be able to ask for the data that's been gathered about them. Um, but Facebook has argued in court that even showing the categories of data that is gathered about their users would reveal trade secrets and they would lose their competitive advantage toward their, 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 uh, their competitors. And so a large portion of how these decisions gets made is often in this black box kind of model of some data goes in, an answer comes out, you don't get to know why, it's just there. Often even, as we see with Google and, uh, and social media and things like that, it's, it's even built for the user not to ask that question in the first place. You just see the posts that you see on Twitter or Facebook, um, and you're not really supposed to be asking why they're there. Some of this is changing, and we'll talk a little bit about that in, uh, later. Um, another issue where bias gets introduced and built into these systems is that they're never really able, I don't, shouldn't say never, very, very rarely able to actually use features that are the feature they're trying to predict. For example, in our hiring, uh, our hiring system, we don't have a definition of good employee that we can put a one through 10 score to. We have different features within their resume, or we have different features within the results of outcomes for people who we have hired, but we're using proxies for all of these. And of course we are in statistical methods. That's what you're very often doing. If you had the exact data, you wouldn't need a complicated model for it a lot of the time. But the point is that we use proxies for these things and that often the proxies that get chosen can be proxies for features we would have not admitted were involved in the data in the first place and would not have wanted to be included in our decision making as, as we were making those decisions. So take again our hiring example. If someone proposed that we did our hiring based on race, age, or gender, we would very often say, no, that's not at all appropriate. I hope that every one of us would say, no, that's not at all appropriate to, you know, to be excluding, uh, you know, excluding women or excluding people of color or things like this. And yet, within the data, there are very often proxies for these sorts of things. Zip code can tell us a lot about the, the racial makeup of someone's neighborhood that they're, they're living in um, or their income level. Um, there, we'll see other examples of very clear proxies for features that if you told the person this is what I'm choosing based on, they would generally not want to be choosing based on that. But again, because of that black box design, we don't even get to know that those are the proxies that are being used. 
then we don't get to stop and think about, even if we're told what the features are that are being chosen on, uh, people often fail to stop and think about, what is that really a proxy for? So these, these, these different features that are actually being used can stand in for things that are discriminatory. <clears throat> so as you can imagine, when pre prejudice is present in the existing data, the algorithm's job is to optimize for it. The algorithm's job is to match best whatever the data tells it was success. And so if success in the past was that we generally, let's say with a very low probability rate, women who we brought in for interviews, we hired them with a very low probability, then the algorithm will say, that's not worth your resources. Don't invite them for interviews. It will, and it, again, it will do this in the background without necessarily telling us that that's, what happened, well, that's what's happening. And probably we were not aware that that bias was in our data or if it's from a larger company, we weren't aware that that bias was in the Fortune 500 company data that it was using. But if that bias is present in the system, what we see time and time again is that the algorithms will even more ruthlessly match to it. Um, and so, excuse me, so we can get often these feedback loops. If an algorithm is then also processing on the new data that's generated from its behavior, and it was starting from biased data, then acting on that bias, then it gets even further biased data, and it will continue to perpetuate that bias and feed back and further accentuate those, those, those proxies for things that we as a society don't want to be uh, you know, discriminating around. Um, so we can see examples of this in um, some police forces use software to help them predict where it would be most useful to patrol and to, to sort of watch out for crime. If a particular neighborhood is already over-policed, then police will have witnessed more crimes in that neighborhood. Therefore, police will continue to focus their resources and perhaps even focus them more exclusively on those neighborhoods that were already over-policed and continue to witness more crimes, especially when you consider that many of the crimes that get fed into these systems are the kind of nuisance crimes, uh, you know, noise violations, uh, small drug charges, things like this, that wouldn't be a charge against a person, wouldn't have any re record of them if there were not police there to notice it already. They don't occur with any more frequency necessarily in those particular neighborhoods. They get noticed more in those particular neighborhoods and, and, and therefore discrimination on income and race, for example, can become perpetuated by an algorithm that would focus resources more uh, in those communities and notice more crimes again in those communities. Um, the other thing that I wanna point out is that typically, again, because of this competitive black box nature, um, the creators of these algorithms or the users of these algorithms don't have access or motivation to access information about alternatives or about the outcomes they missed. So again, take our hiring example. So we have five candidates that the algorithm chose not to even invite for interviews because they were a low, low per probability of being hired here. Maybe it made that decision based on zip code. Maybe it noticed that it said women's society of something in their resume, and it will, and it will, it will make those associations when we aren't willing to admit it or didn't look for whether those associations were there. So what it can't do is correct itself if that same individual got hired at a comparable institution and was very successful there. It won't be given those records. So these are closed systems in ways that um, something like, say, baseball statistics. If a team chooses a player based on their statistical model, and then that player goes on to be very successful at another team, that's public, that's open, that's available, and they will correct their model based on it. And it is in their best interest to do so because fans will start to notice the people that you turn down are going to other teams and doing better. So these models don't have access to that information and they don't typically have a motivation to, to get that access to that information or to make those corrections necessarily because if we're still hiring people that historically would have been a good fit 
under possibly discriminatory past practices, we'll still be very happy with the candidates we get and we won't know anything about the candidates that we missed out on necessarily, unless it's a very connected community in which we're really sharing lots of data with our, our, our com comparable institutions. So here's one more example with a little more serious and concrete of uh, an impact on people. This information comes from a system called Compass. It's, uh, it was part of a ProPublica investigation about machine learning and artificial intelligence-based decision-making. So Compass and systems like it are used in the legal system to assess the risk that an individual will commit further crimes. If they're already in the system in some way, we're choosing whether to charge them, we're choosing how much bail, if any bail, to allow them out on, and we're cho also choosing sentencing durations based on the risk that that individual will commit a further crime. So, for instance, judges get to see these kinds of ratings when making their decisions around sentencing. And again, it does not explain itself. It just makes the decision and gives a risk score and an assessment to the individual. So here we have two individuals, Dylan Fugit, who's rated with a low risk of three, and Bernard Parker, who's rated with a high risk of 10. Um, <laughs> and so this particular system, Compass, makes a decision based on 137 answers to, or answers to 137 questions. Some of these questions are from the person's past criminal record or things like that, so they're from their file and looked at that way. Some of these questions are based on the assessment of the person doing the, the uh, entering into the system. For instance, do you assess this person to be a risk of being a gang member? is one of the questions that's included in the system. And then some of the questions are based on the person's personal history um, that typically they're left to answer. Things like, were your parents divorced? Um, did you get in fights at school? Um, do you often have trouble paying bills? Um, and, oh, there was another one. Oh, how often do you move? Uh, was another example of some of the questions that are included in the, the system's decision making for this. So each of those questions could serve as a piece in its model, building the probability that someone might be uh, a risk of reoffending, of committing further offenses. And it will weight each of those questions based on the data that's being fed of past historical records of who got, not necessarily who committed offenses, again, it's important to point out those proxies, but who got caught, arrested, and charged with later offenses. So, Dylan Fugit was rated as a low risk of three. Bernard Parker was rated as a high risk of 10. This is, of course, just one example, but Dylan Fugit's offense at the time was an attempted burglary. He was subsequently arrested and charged three more times, um, whereas Bernard Parker's offense was one nonviolent resisting arrest and had no subsequent offenses. This is one example. It doesn't prove the entire system is wrong. I would encourage you to look into the, the, the actual report on this, but that, this, the, that the report's general finding was that the system had two kinds of errors it very commonly made. It very commonly rated white offenders as low, lower risk than the results played out, and it very commonly rated black offenders as higher risk than the results played out. So false negatives in the case of white people were much more common and false positives were much more common in the case of black people. So again, we can see the ways that those proxies in the data can, the proxies in the model and the bias in the data can combine to weight features that were definitely there in the past and being used in the way that policing was done in this example, in the way that hiring was done, in the way that promoting things on social media was done, and that it will, it will then be accentuated by the systems that are put in place to, uh, to, to, to make those decisions. So my last point about reasons that we should have social justice in computer science was who's allowed and encouraged to participate in computer science. So I'll briefly talk about that. These three pictures show um, Margaret Hamilton, who worked at NASA and uh, did a lot of the code for uh, sending sh uh, sh rockets to the moon. Um, <coughs> Dorothy Vaughn, who you can see in the movie uh, Hidden Figures, um, who 
started one of the first actual programming groups at NASA, learned uh, how to program and taught it to the people that worked, for, worked with her, and um, was really seminal in start, uh, developing that program there at NASA. And then Grace Hopper here in the middle and some of her colleagues. Um, and so my point in this is that, you will notice these are black and white images, and that women in the beginning of computer science, and, in, and, 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 especially, and as, well, as well as women of color, were very important in the development of computer programming as a field. It was originally seen as a clerical job, um, comparable to data entry. You're just putting in numbers and equations, and who cares? Um, and it was found to be a much more creative and much more scientific task to do, and as that was seen and as it was professionalized and as it was brought into the academies, um, the women in the, in the field were predominantly pushed out either actively um, through sort of hiring and firing decisions or a little more passively in terms of the marketing and the image that was presented. If you look, there's, a, there's interesting but sad history of watching the advertisements for computer programming jobs. Um, that they go from very targeted toward getting women into the workplace toward targeted toward getting men presenting that sort of like geeky guy in the garage, which is an image that we all love and enjoy perhaps, but is, uh, is one that was presented as more of the exclusive image of what computer programming could be like until we reach the point where we have technology workplaces where, for example, Zillow had such a, an egregious record of female employees being sexually harassed that it was referred to in one place as sexual torture. Um, Google executives uh, were involved in sexual misconduct allegations against women and um, that, in fact, Google did things, uh, it's argued, to cover this up. Um, and that, in general, there are statistics that show that even when we bring in women and people of color into uh, technology workplaces, that often the culture is one such that uh, people, the, the attrition rates are very high, people leave, and it's, it's even to the detriment, as this little piece points out, of the organizations themselves. It costs them money to lose people and to lose, uh, you know, to invest the resources, but it's such a built-in part of the culture in some ways that we have to work against that, uh, that, that it's, <coughs> that it, it, it's, in spite of the cost, it continues to go on. So uh, a few little quick statistics about undergraduate degree rates in computer science. So women overall stood at 19%. This is 2012. Uh, I picked up the NSF because I felt it was most reliable. I'm sure there are newer numbers um, that folks could dig into as well. But it's, it's still about this 19, 20% rate for women. Um, African American graduates, there was 11% in bachelor's level. 30% of those were women, so 30% of that 11%. And then Latinx individuals graduating was a rate of 9%, which was 19% of that was women. And it's worth pointing out, this is the kind of thing that people refer to when they talk about intersectionality as well, by the way, because you will notice that while it is 19% women in the Latinx population, that is 19% of the 9%. So these things compound if you are a, a member of one or more than one marginalized community, a historically excluded community in a space, these, these impacts compound on you and that they, they build up. So looking a little more hopefully, what can social justice in computer science look like? Because we want to do it now, I hope, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so accountability for those applications of CS, those things that people actually actively choose to build um, so Google employees put together a, a large-scale petition against Project Maven, that drone targeting uh, contract, and uh, Google has said that they will be shutting that project down. Um, similarly, after a civil rights lawsuit, Facebook has said that they'll change the way that job ads are allowed to be posted on their sites. We can and should and do make change in these organizations and push back on the kinds of decisions that are made of, of how um, CS is used. And we can also push for accountability on um, the, the hosting level of things, the what people are enabling and permitting um, at a sort of legislative level. One thing to be aware of is the Communications Decency Act um, has a section 230, uh, which is immunity for hosts of services um, that says that the companies like Facebook or Google or other websites 
um, are immune from prosecution uh, against crimes that are committed through their technology or that kind of thing, up to the point where one website where a lot of human trafficking was going on was actually pr uh, pr pronounced immune from prosecution related to that because of this section of, of the Communications Decency Act. And this is, these sorts of things are in lots of places in the law. Surprisingly, not uh, one of the exceptions allowed is copyright infringement. If copyright infringement is going on in your site, you can be prosecuted. If child trafficking is going on in your site, you cannot be prosecuted. So it's worth looking at what can be done to change those things, and, and we can. Um, inclusion and changing culture. Um, and so I point this out here because here are a couple of the organizations that I've worked with and that I think are good. Um, Girls Who Code and Black Girls Code are both organizations that do a lot of great work um, to get girls, to get people of color involved in computer science. And as I mentioned before, uh, we also have to change culture. We also have to work on making our disciplines more inclusive and more welcoming uh, to people who have been historically excluded from those settings. So one of the examples of ways that computer scientists are doing this now is writing up codes of conduct for our organizations, uh, which we have had many battles and arguments on. Um, but the Linux operating system is one example where a very big but a controversial one was put into place after the founder of Linux admitted that he had been engaging in activities that were very, uh, he wouldn't use these words, but oppressive of others, pushing others out of the community because they didn't fit his model of how a Linux programmer should be. And, he, and, and the admission is that often those models of how a Linux programmer should be is that white guy in a garage tinkering at a computer. So building up these actual codes to hold each other accountable and, and f make our communities accountable and inclusive ones. Um, combating bias, like I talked about, which was sort of my big geek out larger uh, portion of the talk, um, and demanding transparency in these kinds of algorithms. So there's a group called the Algorithmic Justice League, uh, which is an awesome name, by the way, um, that they do work on finding when algorithms have bias included in them and, in, and bias is being perpetuated by their decision making and creating systems for detecting that kind of bias in algorithms. If you take an algorithm and look at its results, and if you're actually thinking critically and aware of what kind of bias it might have present in it, you can find it. Um, and so, and there's just not an, much incentive financially for companies to do this. However, there's becoming more incentive. So the European Union privacy laws have pushed a lot more around transparency, and that has created a lot more room for this. Um, so companies like IBM now are launching tools that can detect AI bias and explain automated decisions. Explainable AI is another big area that's coming up that on its own won't solve the problem. If it tells you all those proxies and you ignore that those proxies are proxies for race, age, gender, et cetera, it won't solve the problem, but it can start to help to bring light to it. And then the ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, has recently uh, started a conference on fairness, accountability, and transparency in computer science. And there's some really good resources. If you don't have access to those, you should try to get access to those and, and check out some of the things that are being done around that area. Um, specifics of how you can work towards social justice in computer science and perhaps in other disciplines of science are um, being aware of what CS is being used for by the companies or the organizations you interact with. You use Google, then you're interacting with a company that has tried to do things like drone targeting or has bias in its search results and, and washes its hands of the responsibility of that bias. Um, and so you can speak up and you can try to use your relationship with those companies or those organizations, like the Google employees did, to try to make change in those organizations. You can advocate for the use of decision-making algorithms that do explain themselves. They exist and they're starting to get more and more common. Or you can ask the providers, if you're signing up for a new system that would help you to filter out different resources that are available to students, ask them how they have addressed bias in the underlying data. If books by white people were the ones that were much more commonly checked out in the past, that is a piece of bias that will be in their data. How have they addressed that? Because they should. You can work with organizations that are promoting inclusion in CS and related fields, and there are people doing the work, right? There is some group of people that is doing work related to these things. You should enter into relationships with them. You should find out the work that they're doing, and you should, you should see how you can help to empower and further that. Um, and 
This means even going as far as the student groups on your campus that surround or that work around a particular issue. Even if you don't have a society of women engineers or society of black engineers on your campus or something like that, you likely have a black student union or you likely have other student organizations that would be thrilled to be a part uh, or to, to be taking uh, you know, a role in doing some work with you on these things. Our library here did several um, Wikipedia edit-a-thons to help to address bias in the number of Wikipedia entries about particular groups of people. Women and Native Americans were the ones that I know of. Um, and there's plenty of room for lots of other things like that. One of the things that's on the more sort of interpersonal level that I want to plant somewhere in people's minds wherever I can is recognizing that your colleagues from marginalized groups, colleagues from groups that have been historically excluded from your field, are doing some labor related to these issues, even if it is not by choice, even if it is not active, and typically it is completely unacknowledged. Uh, this could range as far as being the person who always gets asked to be on the diversity committee to being the person who the grand majority of students come to to talk about issues like, I just came out to my parents and this is a very difficult thing. There's work that's being done around these things, or even if it's as simple as just that feeling of isolation of being the only person who fits X category and people not having similar experiences. And while you may not be able to change that at all times, uh, certainly being aware of it and trying to look for the ways that you might be exacerbating it or that you could help to you know, field something uh, and, and make it a little easier when that diversity group comes around and if no one's standing up yet, then you can be the person. Um, and likewise, if that work is getting done, advocating that it should be paid, it's work. People should be paid for it and have acknowledgement for it on a professional level wherever possible. Um, so these are ways that you can, on an interpersonal level, help your colleagues with that. Acquiring and promoting materials and resources that show how CS or your discipline contributes to systems of oppression. Uh, you know, if you're in medical sciences, the history of how uh, you know, medical research has been done in biased ways or things like that, and how it can be used to dismantle them. There are examples out there, and taking a look at those and promoting those resources can go a long way toward making sure that others at your institution, be they professionals or students, get involved and get a picture of this kind of work and how it can be done. These are small. If, uh, if we have an opportunity to make the slides available, I will definitely do so and make it uh, more available to everyone. So here are a few resources that I would point you toward. And as I said, I'm missing things. Let me know if you find one that I am missing and there's something that I should be including and paying attention to. So uh, th three of these books, Virginia Eubanks' Automating Inequality, Sophia Moja Noble's Algorithms of Oppression, and Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of Math Destruction deal primarily with the decision-making algorithms with the bias kind of parts of what I've talked about. Um, I will highlight to you, because I know who you are, uh, that Sophia Noble's background is in uh, library sciences, and so <laughs> she may be someone that you will have uh, you know, connected experiences with. Um, when looking at that, and she deals heavily with this question of um, when Google presents biased results, then what is the actual responsibility and how can we put some responsibility and some motivation for change into those, those systems. Um, Marie Hicks' Programmed Inequality is about the history of computer science and how um, it became uh, a strongly racially and gender segregated field uh, over time and was not originally. Um, and it's, it's a really good sort of resource and history on that and to give people kind of a pointer for how their field doesn't actually have to be the way that it might feel stuck in at this moment. Um, the little video that I showed you is a part of this bigger video, Big Data Inequality and the Law, that includes Latanya Sweeney and Alvaro Bedoya. Um, and they talk about those sorts of issues and on a broader scale as well. And then if you're a podcasting person, uh, the Cause a Scene podcast is a really good podcast on um, technology and STEM and how to sort of disrupt these systems of oppression in those fields. And that is what I have for you.